All right, let's get started this morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody out this morning. The beautiful faces. You look around at the people beside you and say, You look good this morning. <laughs> Some of you might have had to lie, but that's okay. You've got to forgive me. No, I'm just kidding. So good to have everyone out this morning. Hey, I got an announcement before I get started, uh, before we get started this morning. Anybody that is had, well, let me say this, start praying about it, okay? If you are late on your heart to work with our, in our children's program and our youth program, I would really, really encourage you to, uh, next Sunday after church, we're going to meet in the uh, adult Sunday school room. We're just going to talk for just a few minutes. Uh, we really need some help in that area, our children and our youth program. So if that is you, you've, you've maybe God has said, hey, I, I feel kind of that nudge. Be here next Sunday. Let me let's let's find out where it is that God wants to place you in that. We uh, desperately need that. So next Sunday, anybody willing to work with our children and our youth, uh, please be a uh, be here next Sunday and be a part of that, and we'll we'll plug you in. All right. Well, let's stand to our feet this morning and just pray, and then get our hearts prepared this morning to uh, hear a word from God. All right. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. God, thanking you so much for this opportunity and the privilege to be here this morning, to be able to, to be your hands and feet, but God, also just to be able to fellowship with our, our uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, to come this morning to, to lift up your name. God, just to be able to hear a word from you. God, we know that you're at work all around us, and we know, God, that you love us and you love this community. And God, you have a plan and a purpose for us. And Lord, we just pray this morning as we sing and as we hear the the word preached god you would just draw our hearts into what you're doing that god we would leave here this morning knowing that we have spent time with almighty god we will leave here this morning and god take the the love of christ outside of these doors into our community lord we thank you for loving us and we thank you father god for this opportunity we pray it all in jesus name amen Marvelous light of grace, out of darkness, out of shame. By the cross, you are the truth, you are the life, you are the way. I once was fatherless, a stranger with no. Your kindness waking me, waking me from my sin. Your love it beckons deeply, a call to come and die. By grace now I will come and take this life, take your life. darkness out of shame by the cross you are the truth you are the life you are the way my dead heart now is beating my deepest stains now clean your breath fills up my lungs now I'm My dead heart now is beating, my deepest stains now clean, your breath fills up my lungs, now I'm free, now I'm free. darkness out 
the same By the cross you are the truth You are the life, you are the way It's a marvelous light I'm Out of darkness, out of shame By the cross you are the truth You are the life, you are the way Lift my hands and spin around See the life that I've found Oh, the marvelous life, marvelous life Lift my hands and spin around See the life that I've found Oh, the marvelous life, marvelous life Out of darkness, out of shame By the cross you are the truth You are the life, you are the way It's a marvelous God I'm Out of darkness, out of shame By the cross you are the truth You are the life, you are the way
in all I everybody. I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, I'm going to read a post off of Facebook and uh, I haven't done that before. I haven't used my iPhone up here so if it disappears then y'all just hang with me. I hope I can do it some justice but uh, I haven't told Bonnie I'm going to use this but it's um, Bonnie Carr's um, post uh, a couple of days ago but as I was trying to just get some words to, to say, to encourage everybody and to just bring us into a relationship in our Lord's Supper. Um, I couldn't get past this post, so I'm gonna do some reading, but um, basically it says that at one time we did not have a relationship with God, but now we do. And there's a transition in there that um, Bonnie's gonna talk about as I read it. And, um, you know, it reminds me of some of the roads I've taken in life, just going down this road so long, taking up so much time, and it's not going anywhere. And then finally, I feel like I'm lost, and that's where God wants us, is to just stop and say, God, I need help. And um, that's when God's going to come in, bring you alive in Christ, and uh, give you the Spirit. Of eternal life and uh, just his relationship will come alive in you so so y'all hang with me on this okay I want to do it some justice so my, I hope I don't do any stuttering um, but she says I remember when I did not know God as personal as I do today people would talk of him yet I could not understand it's when you put your brilliant mind at rest and believe and receive him. He awakens your heart and a knowing comes upon you. We try to understand everything. Trust in the Lord. This is from Proverbs. Trust in the Lord. Now try to figure him out, okay? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in every way and he will guide your path. We are all here for a reason. We believe we pass through this life to an eternal life with God, our forever home. He has placed that in us as believers and that lets our heart and mind 
rest in Him. We can rest in our salvation. A knowing our now and future is in Him. And that is a great security. And then she has a prayer. I believe and receive you, Lord God, creator of all. You gave me purpose and your love. You gave your life for me to show me how to live and die, to ways and become new in you. You made me righteous. And remember, who's doing all this? We're not making ourselves righteous. God is. You made us righteous, right with you. You sanctified me. You set me apart in you. You redeemed me. I am a child of God. I am loved, accepted, forever yours, justified, made perfect in your sight. I have a place in heaven with you. You are alive in my heart by the Holy Spirit, love and power with a sound mind of you. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for giving me a life through you. Amen. And finally, she says, get in his word. Get in a Bible-based church. Surround yourself with believers and watch the Holy Spirit make you come alive with him. Experience for yourself. Truth comes alive in you. Why so many Christians? Because we experience God's love, his truth. When you love something, you share that love. You know it's a difference in you that you cannot do for yourself. And I always say, God can do for you what you cannot do for yourself. It's the most amazing journey I've ever been on. We are called to be different. Yes, I am. Better on this side than the other side. We make mistakes, but we repent and let God help us to do life better every day. We give it to God and let him do the work in us. Hold it, the Holy Spirit can and will help you. You need to let him in and you will see what happens. So... Couldn't get that off my mind this week. Um, couldn't get it out of my heart. So um, if you're not on Bonnie's Facebook, you need to, <laughs> to, to call her, okay, or text her or something. But uh, she puts a lot of inspiring things um, on the social media. So with that said, um, you know, I hope you do have a relationship with God. And guys, it all began just right here, and this is what we're going to remember and as we have these busy weeks, I know Sheila's been out of town and you get business on your mind. We need to remember that Christ did it all for me. The creator of everything came to live and to die for our sins. And uh, through the resurrection life, he has broken that power that Satan held over us, the bondage of sin and death. So I just want to praise him this morning. I want to ask blessings over you as you take communion, and I'm just asking for a renewing of your heart, a remembrance of what Christ did for us, and that God loves you no matter what. So let's pray. If the uh, servers will come, it's kind of what I figured. I didn't think I had any, okay? <laughs> so if I can get the couple, there we go. We got them coming. So... That's what happens when Seth and Tim aren't here, okay? But let's pray. Our gracious God, it's just so good, Lord, to hear your name, to think of you, to uh, be with other believers of like mind. As we're in this busy world, Lord, that's pressing against us, you give us your spirit of life to press back, Lord, and to stand in the gap and to just let people know who we are in Christ. We love you, Lord, for giving your life for us, for uh, suffering as bad as you did. But yet, Lord, we're most grateful for that resurrection power that now lives in us. We love you, Father. We thank you for Bonnie's post and just what she means to our church. And uh, we just want to lift this prayer as we celebrate the resurrection of your life in us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
I was on a, taking a trip down memory lane. Today, me and my uh, wife celebrate our 29th year anniversary. So, yeah, and she's in the nursery. And I guess there's just something about your anniversary. And then when you come to church to attend worship and have your oldest daughter lead worship, it leads you back through 29 years. And I'm just thinking back through 29 years of this curly head little girl about yay tall running around the house. And to uh, see what you've done today with your life is awesome, man. Thank you for your leadership today and uh, the worship. But um, I want to turn to a different uh, passage today. We're going to be in the book of Matthew. Um, and we'll start in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 23, only to show in that. You, you will really be in Matthew chapter 13. But in Matthew chapter 12, verse 23, the crowds are beginning to amass and grow around Christ and understandably why because as the miracles are performed and the healings happen and the teachings that he teaches with such authority the crowds start to amass and start to follow him wherever he goes and so you can see that in chapter 12 and in verse 23 the crowds are growing and they're they're getting larger and that leads us the same crowd that's following Christ and growing by the miracle, growing by the teaching of Christ, carries us into Matthew chapter 13. The same crowd is now growing. And so in Matthew chapter 13, and if you were here on Wednesday night, uh, the students anyways, we covered some of this on Wednesday night, right, Tim? And it was a good night. And uh, we're going to continue with it this morning. So in Matthew chapter 13, um, starting in verse 1, Crowds are growing, and it says, On that day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. And such large crowds gathered around him that he had to get into the boat and sit down while the crowd stood on the shore. And so there's this large crowd gathering around Christ, like I said, from his teachings, from his miracles, so large that as Jesus is trying to get a moment on the seaside, looking at the waves come in, that it's getting large enough that for him to be of any effect at all, he's going to have to get in the boat and push off away from the shore and teach from the boat instead of on the shore so that everybody could hear. And that's the setting, the crowd, Jesus, and he's into the boat. And then it says that he's going to tell them many things in parables. And this begins the section in Matthew where he's going to go parable after parable. And it's not by chance that this is the first parable that he gives. And we'll see that in a minute. But let's read the parable, the story that Jesus uses. And what Jesus is doing is he's taking a, an, a modern day example, a story, and teaching a biblical truth with it. And so I know you have heard this before. And the reason I'm speaking it today and talking about this today is I uh, woke up um, Monday morning and just really impressed this. God had really just impressed a verse here on my life. And so, Jeremy, this is where you're at. And I'll share that in a minute. And so in Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 3, the crowd's on the beach on the seaside, and Jesus is in the boat. And Jesus is going to tell them many things in parables. And he said this, Consider the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil and grew up quickly. Since the soil wasn't deep, but when the sun came up, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it. Still other seed fell on good ground and produced fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. And then he concludes that with, let anyone who has ears to hear hear or listen and so you have these four different groups of people and you see them readily and you know them you probably have heard them in verse four we know that the the sower sows seeds along a path and the birds come and consume those seeds and nothing grows in verse five through six you have the rocky ground that the immediately grows but without any root it doesn't take hold and then verse 7 you have the thorny ground where, where thorns and weeds choke out the uh, seed that was sown and then in verse 8 the good soil so the four different groups after telling this story in verse 10 the disciples asked Jesus the question what does the story mean why are you telling this in a story? And so if the disciples ask it, we can ask it. Now, in Mark's account of the same story, 
in Mark chapter 4 and verse 13, on the heels of being asked when the disciples said, Jesus, what does this story mean? Jesus responded with this in Mark, or, or Mark writes this point down. Do you not understand this parable? If you don't understand this parable, you won't understand any of them. So that's why I think it's not by chance that this is the first one recorded. And it's not by chance that Jesus told the parable and our ears should, you know, get tuned in because what is recorded for us in Mark is that if we don't get this one, we won't understand any of them. So I want to understand this one, you know, and, and look at it just a little bit further. And so then we're going to skip the middle section. This, And I'm going to come back to it, and I have a reason why I'm doing it this way. But So Jesus tells the story in the first part, you know, the, the parable, the account, in the very first verses. And then in verse 10, the disciples says, what does all that mean, Jesus? What's the story about? What's this parable? What's this uh, point of this? And then he's going, we're going to get into that middle section, but then the tail end of this parable, verses 18 through 23, Jesus is going to explain further what this parable means and how we can apply it to us today. And so in verse 18, Jesus says this, listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one who has sown along the path. And the one that's sown on rocky ground, this is the one that hears the word and immediately receives it with joy but has no root and is short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, immediately they fall away. Now the one sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the worries of this age and the deceitfulness of wealth choke out the word and it becomes unfruitful. But the one sown on good ground, this is the one who hears and understands the word, who does produce fruit and yields some hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. And so Jesus explains the verse there, and you can see the correlation that he does. And what I want you to see here, and I think this is key for the understanding of the parable, uh, because I know that you no doubt have heard the four different groups explained, and I'll briefly touch on that. But I want you to see the differentiation between the two groups there. On the crowd, in the crowd, you have the crowd of people that have gathered around in part because the miracles that have been done, because of the teachings and the authority of Christ and just how they hit home when you get a good message and you're just like, I, I recognize that. And so people are following Jesus. So you have this crowd and you also have the disciples that are there. Now, if you go to verse 11, this is the middle portion that I'm going to talk about just for a little bit today because I think this is where the point of this parable is at. You have the crowd you have the disciples. So there's going to be a differentiation between the two. In verse 11, see what it says there? So the disciples in verse 10 said, Why are you speaking to them in parables? What does this mean, Jesus? In verse 11, it says, and this is a little bit hard to read and hard to understand. Um, I'll say that from the outset. But verse 11, it says, The secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given for you to know, but has not been given to them. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean for Jesus to answer the disciples when he said, I tell them this story about the four things, and the disciples say, what, what, what does that mean, Jesus, about these four different types of soil? And Jesus responds with, you've been given the secrets, they have not. Why the differentiation? So Jesus makes a differentiation between the crowd and the disciples. Now, what is the differentiation? And I want to, I think, drive that to the point. And I believe we'll see then what's the, what's the underlying tone of this parable. And so in the crowds, what I want to say about that is, turn back a couple of chapters in Matthew chapter 11 and in verse 16. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 16. Now remember these crowds are growing and growing and growing, getting bigger by the day, by the miracle, by the teaching. And in Matthew chapter 11, and starting in verse 16, and speaking to the crowds as a whole, this is what Christ says. To what should I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in marketplace who call out to other children. We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a song of lament, but you didn't mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. 
The son of man came eating and drinking, and they said, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. And so what Jesus says there is that when these children gathered and played the flute, there should be a response. The response is dancing. When the children played the lament and played a sad song, the response should be mourning. When John the Baptist was out in the wilderness preparing the way for the Lord and calling to him, what did he say to the Pharisees that came out? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Respond. Have a response. And now look in verse 20. He says, Matthew eleven twenty, 20, the very next verse, Then he proceeded to denounce the towns where most of his miracles were done. And why is it? Because they did not repent. So in these crowds that are gathering and following Christ and coming after him and watching the miracles and watching all of this, Jesus likens the crowd to the people who hear the flute and don't dance, to the people who hear the song of lament and don't mourn, to the people who watch the miracles unfold and not repent. That's the crowd. Now, the disciples standing opposite of that, we pick them up in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. Jesus says he's walking along the Sea of Galilee, another sea. He saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Do you see the difference in response? And Jesus comes along to them, and it, without the host of miracles, without the host of all this, and he says, follow after me, and what do they do? They follow after Christ. There's a response. They hear the flute, and they dance. They hear the song of lament, and they mourn. They bear fruit worthy of repentance. And then again, if you look in Matthew chapter 7, verses 17 through 20, two tree stories here. Jesus says, you'll recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into fire. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. It's a response. It's response. And then, um, and then in Matthew 12, 33, right preceding this is, Jesus says again, a tree is known by its fruit. And so what I want you to see here is when Jesus gives this analogy of the four different types of soil, and then we see the differentiation between the crowd and the disciples and what Jesus speaks of the crowd is these are unresponsive people. They're following, but they're not moving. They're interested, but it's not making any difference. It's not making a real change. They're inquisitive, but haven't come to that point to where they hear. And that's why Jesus told the disciples, standing opposite of that, who left everything and immediately followed him, Jesus says, of those, the ones who are following but haven't made the commitment, they can't hear this. And this parable is actually clouded. And it actually even hardens them more. They, they misunderstand even more. And to the disciples who have said, I'm going to follow after you, they understand it and more is given. Now, one thing that I do understand is this, and, and John mentioned it this morning, I don't think it's by chance, that John said, you know, you can't figure everything out about the Lord, Right? You never can. You won't, or you'd be equal, and you're not. And so one of the things I do know about that I've seen in my walk with the Lord and that you probably have seen in your walk with the Lord, and, and I've heard it many times said that God works like headlights on a car, right? That he doesn't show me. He, I promise you, when he saved me in 2000, he didn't show me this. I promise you. But like headlights on a car, you can see so far. And God doesn't show you the next part till you move to that part. But what is the key? Move. Respond. And so Jesus says, respond, there's the key. Now, 
What are some of the hindrances that keep us from responding? Now, I do struggle with this a little bit in the fact that there's a clear differentiation here. There's the crowds and there's the disciples. The disciples are following after Christ. The crowds are inquisitive and looking at Christ. And so I struggle with the differentiation. Does that mean that the first three or four lost and the crowds and the fourth only applies to salvation or but I have also seen in my life that all four can apply to both unbelievers and believers. And so I, I struggle a little bit with that differentiation there and bringing that to a head. But here's just what I want to say real quickly is that, because I'm going to do this in reverse order, is that when you see these different hindrances that keep people from understanding, the first one there, and you've seen it, was that um, Jesus said in the story, in the parable, that the sower throws the seed and that the bird comes and immediately snatches it up and takes it away. And, and the explanation of it, after asking what does it mean, Jesus says, instead of the bird, he says, he casts the seed, and Satan immediately comes and takes it away and destroys it. And it's just, it's just this mindset that, you know, everything's so busy and you just don't have time to focus on it at the moment. And you just don't have time to give it enough attention and look at it deep enough and, and to ponder on it and to dwell on it. And so it just kind of hits, it hits the surface and immediately Satan comes and takes it away and it bears no fruit, it bears no response. Then the second one that Jesus talks about is he says, there's seed that's thrown on the rocky path and it has a little bit of soil, but it's not deep rooted and it's not going down deep into the soil and so when persecution comes when you're called to the carpet because of your faith or when you have to make a stand because of your faith or as Jesus said the talking about disciples he said they'll hate you because they hated me they'll persecute you because they persecuted me and that when that persecution comes there's not enough to hold and just it goes away and then the last one and here's where God spoke to me and that's why I believe and that, that this is what I felt like God was saying to me is that the last one is these thorns and these weeds and these bristles that come up from everyday life and we have so much that's going on and so much we're involved in I mean you got to check Facebook and TikTok and emails and text messages and then you got to go to work we just have so little downtime do we not we really have so very little downtime. And if you're not careful, those can just start choking out everything that's effective and everything that's meaningful and everything that's real. And, and, and I was just dwelling, really, you know, pondering life, I guess you would call it, and just thinking about things and praying through things. And I really felt like God just said, you know, you might just have too many thorns. But what do you do when the thorns are necessary thorns? can't really do anything about them you know you got work pressures you got home pressures you can't really just say I'm gonna cast them in the fire and burn them you know you can't do that so what do you do and I think what Jesus is pointing out in this passage is um, I was telling the youth on Wednesday night that look for the word that repeats and find the word that repeats in this passages and if you look back through it you will see over and over again Jesus says here here, here. Then as I was thinking about that, I don't know what your week looks like. Let me just give you a little example of mine. I'm not asking for pity. I'm not asking for sorrow. I'm not asking for you to say, hey, how can I help you? I'm not asking for any of that. I'm just going to tell you what maybe makes my week a little different from yours. And the one would be preparing for this today, this morning. Because I either do it one or two ways. My favorite way is to get up in the morning and just say, oh, work will be working, it'll take care of itself, and I'm going to sit down and study for a little bit, and when I feel like going to work, I'll go to work. Now, I know not everybody has that option, but God has blessed me with what, that ability right now. But oftentimes what happens when I try to do that is I start thinking, man, i got to get that going, i got to get that going, i got to get that going. So oftentimes what happens is that doesn't happen. What does normally happen is, then there's those weeks where I say, because it is really best to prepare a little bit Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because God dwells on it. You start thinking on it, and it, you know, you might walk in here Wednesday night, and John say something, I go, that's the answer, you know? God just puts it together. And so there are weeks where Monday, I'm normally up 3.30, 4 o'clock anyways. I'll sit down, and I know there's some other, other early risers here. I'll sit down for a little bit. 3.30, 4 in the morning, my coffee, my annoying cat, 
Um, he keeps climbing under my feet, and he like does this to the power strip. I'll be right in the middle of a sermon. Boom, he does that on the power strip, and the computer goes out. And then I have to drag him out, and that's a whole different story. But So I start, and maybe I give it about 30, 40 minutes each morning, right? And then Saturday morning, now that, now Saturday morning don't have me work, so I can still get up at 3, 30, 4 o'clock, because I always do. And I can sit down with my coffee and my annoying cat, and I can start to work. And depending on what I want to do that day, because sometimes I want to go ride my motorcycle or I want to go do the razor thing or the Jeep, God, you know, just recreational stuff, I may get four hours, five hours, six hours, just depending on where I'm at and how deep it's going and how it's flowing. And then guess what? This morning, Sunday morning, I also wake up 3, 30, 4 o'clock, and I start going back over it all again. Now, I know that sometimes the sermons don't feel like I've done that much. And if you've had, I know sometimes you've had to sit through some bad sermons, but you should try to preach one, as Chris Young says. That's even worse. I say all that to say this, and I'm not trying to compare, because I've sat there, and I've been here. How have you prepared for today? Because over and over again in this sermon, Jesus says, here, here, here. Here, have you come here this morning? And there's all kind of distractions going on. That's the word following on a path and Satan just, and you leave out of here and you just go. Or you come in here and I'm feeling enthusiastic that day and I'm engaging and you're like glued to me. You're like, I got it. Man, I'm on fire. And then you leave and it just, Shallow faith. Or the third one, you know, and I think that's where I found myself at because I believe that we can find that, is that we find that just life has all this stuff. If we're not careful, that stuff just gets in the way and we can, can become very compartmentalized. Like Sunday I'm going to put on my church hat. Monday I'm going to put on my work hat. Wednesday night I'll put back on my church hat. You know what I mean? We can just let life become so compartmentalized and weeds and thorns everywhere in our life. And I think what Jesus is pointing to in this message is we have to prepare ourselves to hear the word of the Lord. We can't come in, be all distracted, have a million things going on, can't wait to leave work or leave church and get back on your motorcycle, go for a ride or go fishing or mow, whatever your thing is. We need to set aside the time to get serious when we come in together with the church or whether we're at home and engaged in a Bible study with our parents or our, our spouses or whatever. Hear the word of the Lord. I'm going to tell on me for a moment. This week, um, and, and I'm still married, that's amazing, but <laughs> this week I'm just sitting in the living room, just, man, I'm having a great time. And all of a sudden, Deborah comes through. She starts slitting out lights. I'm thinking, man, she's got an attitude. I said, what's wrong, Deborah? And she said, I was talking to you, and you didn't even listen. And she's all mm, up in, I had no idea. And she said, I was talking, and you just didn't hear me. I said, I still don't know what you're talking about. And she said, see, you didn't hear me. We got to be careful that that's not what happens when we gather. That we don't just hear or we don't just listen. Because I had to ask Deborah, what's the difference? Is listening what you want me to do or is hearing what you want me to do? Which one? She said, hearing's what you want because hearing means you took it in and you digested it and you, you, you stewed on it for a minute and then it drove a response. And I think why Jesus says this parable is first and why talks about it first and says this is the key to understanding all of them the key is take a deep breath prepare yourself and hear the word of the Lord dwell on it for the rest of the day think on it hear the flute and dance respond to it don't be the crowd that just sees him at a distance get in a relationship with him it's a beautiful thing. 
It's so good. And I was thankful this week as God reminded me that, he said, Jeremy, you got a lot of thorns. But like I said, they're not thorns I can do anything about. So what I have to do is magnify my focus on the Lord. Make it like the thorns look like this instead of like this, right? So, uh, yeah. Now, let me just say in this in conclusion that if you look at these in reverse order, it's a pretty cool outline. Because if you look at it and you start from the point of view of a good soil, now, to follow me here, the good soil, now in the terms of the, the parable here, Jesus is saying, if you come with an intent focus to hear the word of the Lord, and you hear the word of the Lord, and you let that make a positive impact and a change, and a, you, know, you, you make a difference, right? You turn. You go, oh, I see that. I need to correct that. Or you go, oh, I see that. I'm going to increase and strengthen my faith in the Lord. I want you to see if you look at it in reverse order, that if you start with good soil and you come and you prepare and we're all prepared and I'm prepared and we're all ready to hear the word of the Lord, look what happens as a result if you go in reverse order. So the first thing that happens, item three, item one for us, is it keeps you kingdom focused. You see the difference? You see, the first one that Jesus said was, throw the seed on the path and the birds come away and take it away immediately. So good soil, prepared hearts, hearing the word of the Lord, responding to the word of the Lord keeps you kingdom focused. It puts everything in perspective. Remember, we're not citizens here, we're citizens there. So that's the first thing it does. Second thing, it lets our roots grow deep. So hearing the word of the Lord, responding to it, lets our deep roots and so when challenges of life come, and oh, they will, things will hit you out of nowhere that you never saw coming that will rock you to the core of who you are. And when they do, you stand. And you're not moved. And it started with good soil. Then last, it gives a faith that understands and works. A faith that understands and works and can withstand persecution and you can confidently say, I don't have all the answers and can't answer that question, but I'm placing my faith in the one who does. And you can stand that. I just thought that was pretty cool as I was looking at it, that if you start with good soil and you start with a place where you come and you prepare yourself to hear the word of the Lord, that in reverse order, it really acts as a protectionary mechanism against all these other things. And so... Um, Gardens take time to grow. Um, I'm not a gardener. Can't grow anything. And don't look to improve that. But I do, know that, uh, <laughs> I do know that gardens take a long time to grow. And faith and our spiritual life and our spiritual walk takes time. And it takes work. And it takes, and I'm not saying you're working for your salvation, but you do work to grow your faith deeper. You have to make a conscious effort for it. You have to make a conscious effort towards it. And the conscious effort Jesus here is, I think, laying out. Because if you look at the words it repeats, he who has ears, let him hear. He who has ears, let him hear. He repeats that over and over again in the explanation of this. And so what Jesus is saying is, can you hear me? Or are all the distractions in life choking it out? One pastor said, you're either growing or you're regressing. I'll just close with this. I like closing with uh, a scripture verse as Miranda comes back up. And in Matthew chapter 7, you guys are familiar with this one. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a man, a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded the house, yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a fool who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew, and pounded the house, and it collapsed, and it collapsed with a great crash. Jesus' words are life, they're powerful, they're meaningful, and he expects from us to take the time to attend to them and listen to them and let it drive a response out of our life. So will you stand as I close in prayer and as Miranda will close us with a song. Father God, thank you for today. And thank you for this message of the four different types of soils. And Lord, how um, we need to prepare our hearts and our minds to hear from you. And we need to have a life that seeks you first. So God, I pray that in the busyness of all of our schedules and the hecticness of all of our daily things that we must get done, the 
that, Lord, we don't elevate those as priorities over you. And we take the time to hear from you, for you to steer our lives. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Jesus, you are my King. Jesus, you are my King. Jesus, you just for a moment I, I won't carry this point long but with your hearts open your ears open I want to know I want to just set, read these words of Christ over us and see have you heard these have you taken them to heart and have you responded to them Jesus says seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you do you hear him Jesus says, ask and it will be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone that asks receives and everyone that seeks finds. And to him that knocks it shall be opened. You hear that? What about this one? Jesus said, suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me. For such is the kingdom of heaven. And I will, I'll call, close with this one. And Jesus answering said unto them, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I come to call. I've come not to call the righteous, but to call the sinners to repentance, to a response. Let me just say, if you're here today and you've not made that response to that last word of Christ, to hear Him say, "I love you, I forgive you, I paid for your sins." There's no more message better to hear than that. May that pierce the heart, pierce the mind, and drive home to you this week, today, and listen to the words of Christ and respond with that. I love you, God loves you, and we'll see you Wednesday.